we're in the gallery here and you've got a blue whale's jawbone. Oh, it's a skull that looks like the size of a sort of, what, like an Audi A3? Um, <laughs> Bigger than that? It's, a range it's the size of a long wheel base Enterprise van. There we are. Sprinter. Yeah. Sprint van. Sprinter van. Yes. Do you know that the blue whale is the largest animal to have ever existed? I mean, ever. Like Even ever? Before the dinosaurs. It's the biggest animal on the planet. What, it's bigger than a Stegosaurus? Yep. Bigger than it wasn't it bigger than a Stegosaurus? Oh well, yeah, it's huge. That's nonsense. That's its head, Jack, and it's the size yeah, of a enough. Sprinter van. Enterprise. Yeah. That's a sperm whale. <laughs> Damn it. I did think that that was quite confident, the way you went for that. So what's just, what, what have it's you a, just found out? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a sperm whale. It's not a blue whale. And they're not, sperm yeah. whales aren't the biggest animals. So one of the first things we've learned in a museum is don't make it up yourself. Look, Read, look, look at, at the exhibits. Look at the blurb. That's slightly embarrassing. Hi, I'm the actor Jack Loudon and I'm with my friend and fellow actor Andrew Rothney here at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. And this is... Meet Me at the Museum. That was, that was good. Well, you've... You've got gravitas, I don't. Oh, yeah. Red hair. <laughs> I honestly haven't been this excited for a while. We came to the National Museum of Scotland years ago. Yes. You and I. We've but not been in it since. No. That was like six, seven years ago. And we went round the new bit. Yes. The new bit that was tagged on at the end. Yes. Which is specifically about Scottish yes. history. Yes, yeah. But we've not... No, I've not been in... We've not been here for ages. No. You know, you're, you're literally off George IV Bridge and you're smack in the middle of... Of Robert the metropolis. Lu yeah, Robert Louis Stevenson's old town. Yeah and the university buildings behind. But yeah, that, that is one of my favourite things about the museum, is the fact that... It's so, it's right smack bang in the middle. It's just enormous. There's three big double doors yeah. at the top of these really, really long steps. They kind of look like st the steps at like St Paul's Cathedral. Yeah, yeah. But since the sort of like revamp, they've stuck these side things on that are a little bit more rustic. They're yeah, they're kind of yeah. metal framed. Yeah. With the National Museum of Scotland on top of it, and it's quite futuristic. Yes, like it's been made from like leftover girders, the fourth rail bridge. Did you, you know? design this? I didn't. I, I think just, you did. I should have been involved, though. Yeah. So we're literally in the bowels of the, of the big old Victorian I mean, 1860s yeah. original building. There's someone just leaning yeah. on a exhibit there. <laughs> someone, so, we're watching a man tie his shoelace who, next to what looks like a something sarcophagus. found in <laughs> Tutankhamun's cave. Yeah. So, please excuse us. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to say something. No, he, he will be dealt with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was never seen again. Yeah, you know. We should probably just go and check in. Hi. Book in. Don't know what you do. Okay, check in. Hello. Hello, Hi welcome there. to the National Museum. Thank you, we have our national art passes. Perfect. So, admission is free to all, but with your national art pass, you'll get 50% off the paid exhibitions and also discounted entry to our other sites, the National Museums of Flight and Rural Life. Cool. National Museum of Flight, that's mm -hmm. in East Lothian. East, yeah, East yes, Lothian, I've yeah. Been there. Oh, cool. So, I could have got money off. <laughs> oh, that's annoying. That's <laughs> annoying. <laughs> Next time. Well, thank you very much. That's amazing. Well, that's great. Just head straight up, grab a map, and enjoy your visit. Thank you, thank very you much. so much. Thank you. Scottish history in particular has played a massive part in both of our lives. And it's fascinating. And we've found a mutual love of anything there is to know that happened at least yesterday. Yeah, at least <laughs> yesterday. And I think that... Uh, in Scotland. Uh, like, we didn't know that when we first met. No. I think it's just been a, mutual, a natural mutual love of history and adventure yes. stories. But, we, but we, we met at drama school. That was in 2008. So we've known each other since then. 13 years. Um, and we met probably lying on our backs doing completely unnecessary breathing exercises. I was fire, you were water. Water, yes. Which is sort of like our relationship. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Anyway. I can't really remember us talking too much about history in museums when we were at drama school, but that's, it just sort of ran into and developed into that. And you're right, whenever we, we, you'd be away filming or I'd be away filming, and whenever we found ourselves both in Scotland, mm -hmm. we wouldn't just meet for a coffee... We would go, shall we find a windswept castle somewhere? Shall we fight in Flodden Field? Shall we fight in Flodden Field? We actually did. At one point, we did do that. We wrestled at Flodden. <laughs> wrestled on Which Flodden. was kind of ho quite homoerotic. Yeah. Yes. You know, it but felt right. What, but that's what we did. Yeah, we, we, we visited Flodden and we thought, you know, no, you know, to honour that place properly, we should have a fight. So when the farmer wasn't looking, we rolled about in his crops. 
<laughs> um, to sort of yeah, give the soil back what it had had Absolutely, yeah, honor in the soil. 15. <laughs> yeah. um, and whenever I pass Stirling Castle now in a car, I can't go past it without having you mm-hmm. in my head. Same. Mouth trumpet in. Mm-hmm. What? Braveheart. James Horner's um, Braveheart soundtrack. Score to the Braveheart. We've got background music. So you knew we were coming. Yeah, if you really want people to care about something, put some emotive music on it. Please bear with us for technical difficulties. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> okay, so Scotland transformed. And that's early 1700s to early 1800s. Good years, I'd right. say. Yeah, I mean, not, not, not for all the battles and that. But do, do you know, I became so obsessed with the 1700s in Scotland mm-hmm. and the different Jacobite rise in 1715, 1745, that you know when people go, is it a respectable time to have a drink? Mm-hmm. I always go, well, have a drink after the first rising. So it's 1715, mm. it's definitely acceptable. By 1745, you have your second gin and tonic. That is quite mad. Yeah, well. Uh, you, but you, good, though. You're either in it or you're not. Uh, yeah. like. So, Bonnie Prince Charlie. So this, see, this, see this picture up here that you can see above here? Okay. Of, of the red coats and the Highlanders. So this is a very famous representation of what happened on the moor at Culloden. It ended 1745 rebellion. And on, uh-huh. one, on the right-hand side, you have the British troops, red coats, and on the left-hand side, you have... Highlanders, Highlanders and, and a David Morrier, that's his name, painted this on request from the British government. Of course. And the name of the painting is An Incident in the Rebellion of 1745. An incident. And the, the, the Highlanders that are, that are running into the bayonets of the Brits, some of those, the Jacobites that were captured at mm-hmm. Culloden, a lot of them were taken down and kept on transport ships in the Thames. And to make this picture, the, the artist asked for a bunch of them to get pulled out of the jail and used as life models for him wow. to draw. So you think of how humiliating that must no, have been yeah. for Highland, who didn't speak any English, all they had was Scots Gaelic. Literally stood there with some guy, Egypt, well, well, a couple of paints going, can you just hold your hand up a bit higher? Well, make the face you made. Yeah, when you, when you lost. When you lost. That's, I mean, how that's horrible. incredible. But that's the most famous painting. But, but Culloden, I think, was the last pitch battle fought in British soil. It was indeed. Which it is was. quite quite incredible, but it was it was it was a real real dark spot in Scotland's history and sort of ended in the and pivotal really it was and it ended in the sort of you know the destruction of a whole culture the Gallic culture which is why so few people speak it yeah. today but it's hopefully changing. Out. What so this is oh my god right so this is Bonnie Prince Charlie's travelling canteen that may have been for his twenty first birthday. It quite matches his sword and Taj um, motif of yeah. being incredibly ornate. He loved the bling. He did love bling and he loved a drink, did Charlie? Which was sort of his after undoing, the, wasn't it? After the rising, when he was on the run, he was just sort of, um, I think it was a six or seven month period, and I bet he doesn't even remember most of it. It's like a gig. He probably doesn't remember it because he was off his face. Sozzled. So it's you open it up like a Russian doll. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You open it up and it's got all the gadgets in it, like oh, a fork. Oh my god! Like um, there's a corkscrew. Corkscrew, a little, a little plate, a little dish. This the case itself, the canteen, the case itself is silver, but everything inside is gold. And I would like one of them. I'd, I'd love that. Imagine rocking up what in like a TGI Fridays. Uh, yeah, or you know, you're on no, the train. Go on, sir. I you have know. my own. Yeah. Wow. It's beautiful. It's got like it's got little compartments within it. That you could put your corkscrew, your tiny little mouse dish. Yeah. You so know. That, yeah, when he's eating his uh, avocado and toast. Oh, yeah. It colours. It's like canopies. It's like a canopy. Yeah. Like single use canopy. It is stunning. I just can't get over, I'd never be able to get over when we come here, that that man, that Egypt, actually held that thing there through the glass. Absolutely. Don't you find that nuts? He actually held that. Yeah. People touched these things, held these things. It's, I think that, for me, with Scottish history, or history in general, but, you know, Scottish history, that is the thing for me, is that uh, these people were only... It was only 350, 400 years ago, and although their world is completely different, their thought processes, 
were probably very similar. It's just the circumstances were different. I think that's what's fascinating to me, is that history is very close, really. I mean, 300 years is uh, nothing. I mean, even human beings on Earth is a blink of an eye, 100,000 years. You know, that notion of being like a certain amount of handshakes away from history. Yeah. And like, I wonder how many handshakes you and I are actually away from, you know, the Duke of Cumberland, Bonnie Prince Charlie, the yeah. guy that took the app and Stuart. Like, I wonder how many, it could be as little as 13. Yeah. You know, it's not that, it's not that long ago. It's not. You, there's distance put between us and history, and I think we work in a work in a profession that does that quite a lot, and it makes things a lot sexier. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking speaking for myself, uh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes it cast people. <laughs> <sex appeal. laughs> yeah, but it but it, it sort of puts this sort of film, literally this film, over these historical events, mm. and so it is quite. You really have to work hard sometimes. And I love that when you go in a museum to remind yourself that that no that was a real person that is literally like your dad or your mum, who died on Culloden Field. Well, we also though put on an empathetic head towards those situations. So we we try and imagine ourselves at Culloden, or we try and imagine what life was like under Mary Queen of Scots rule. You know, we we're lucky in that regard that we we're paid to think in those terms, but to see it, to, to be that close to these tactile objects is, is it's just really special. And that, there is a kind of reverence in museums. You notice how quiet it is. Mm. You know, there's an awe of, of seeing something that you can't, you would never have thought you would have seen and things that would surprise you. Oh my God, so these are... These standards. Uh -huh. Actually from Culloden. Oh my God, so these came from there. Amazing, eh? Look. I want to know more about it. Well, as luck would have it, I spot a curator. Hi there. Anna. Hi. Hi, Anna. Hi. Hiya. So you work, you work here at the yeah, museum? I'm lucky enough to work here. That's yeah. amazing, what a job. I'm principal curator, Renaissance and Early Modern History. So oh, this falls into my remit. So the, the, these two standards that were both found on Culloden Moor, and Culloden was the end of the, the Stuart Rebellion. In it was, the, you know, it put the kibosh on the yeah. whole of the uh, Stuart Rebellion. It was the last big battle like that fought. So they were actually found at Culloden? Yeah, no, they were the real thing, and we've got good provenance on them, so we're fairly sure that they're Which is okay. what, 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 so when you say that, what is that? What is the provenance? A, a traceable history that right. we can actually, it's attested, the ownership is attested mm -hmm. right back to where it says it comes from. What, so what, what, what was the last link in the chain where, it came, where they came from here? From this. Stuart of Appin flag, they were one of the first clans to come out in support of Bonnie Prince Charlie, Charles Edward Stuart. They were fighting on the right side of this Stuart line and it fell. 17, they said, number of people picking it off, off the field, holding it again, killed. 17 someone. different people grabbed it at different points. And 17 were killed. But right at the end, seeing the disaster and before everyone fled, mm -hmm. um, someone called Donald Livingston picked it up and he realised its significance. He hid it underneath his clothes. And he had been fighting in the Stuart of Balahulish uh, line. Right. And after the battle, he smuggled it back to Balahulish and gave it to the father of the man that he had been fighting with Stuart of Balahulish. Um, and it remained in their family right through into the 20th century. But what's equally wonderful, I think, is this British flag, the Union Jack, was the victorious flag. Mm -hmm. And during the 19th century, there was a lot of sort of antiquarian interest in the past. Let's say in the 1820s or so, this flag was sort of re-found by an antiquarian called Stuart of Garth. So what he did was to give it to Stuart of Balahulish. Oh my God, right. Uniting two flags mm -hmm. from opposing sides on the one field. And he did it so that they can lie in peace at last. Wow. And I think it's, it's quite an emotional it's story. Moving. That's yeah. moving. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. incredible, mm -hmm. the work that's put into maintain this vital piece of history. They're literally hung on the ceiling 
opposite each other. And they're big. They're not like they're how you enormous. would think of flags. They are. No. I mean, they'd be taller than me if I was to stand uh, by it. And, you're, and you'd be carrying, that. and you'd be someone yeah. can, a pole. Can you imagine that in the Dreek weather? At, yeah. Well, it was May. I don't know if it was Dreek. Yeah. It'll, it'll be Dreek. It'll be Dreek. OK. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, in some ways, you might say, well, why have we got two enemies facing each other? But... In other ways, you might think, well, this is in the spirit of reconciliation that you're bringing these people together. together. Because we forget sometimes when we talk about the Jacobite challenge that there were a lot of people in Scotland who didn't support them, Mm -hmm. including within families. People fell out about it. And fought on the side of the Hanoverians as well. Yes, yes. Because I'm I'm Loudoun of Campbell. Right, Okay. And so that was... Tough to learn. Yeah. <laughs> one of what? Yeah, I mean, what, one of the reasons that Culloden ended in such a disaster for the Jacobites was because the Campbells, through the enclosure, the, uh-huh. the big walled enclosure uh-huh. to the left flank, was sort of penetrated by I think the Campbells of Argyles quick, and it was them that came round in sort of in a pincer movement, and they were one of the fatal blows. So it was, it, you're right. It was it was Scots fighting Scots, mm-hmm. you know. But the, even in, even in the Jacobites. In the Jacobite lines, you had the Manchester Regiment. Mm-hmm. You had English, yeah. English soldiers English fighting on the Jacobite yeah, side. Yeah. I mean, that's, nobody wins in, in this situation. Well, I mean, so there are a lot of Jacobites, English Jacobites. Mm-hmm. Slightly, you wonder if they were in it for the great clothes. Um, yeah. <laughs> for, for, yeah, for the gear. I mean, for it, the did, gear. It, it, it did look yeah. good, I have to say. <laughs> this passion for Scottish history or, you know, stoking about castles, we, it, we didn't meet the first day at Drums and going, oh, I, I love the field at Flodden. What? Me too. It, would, it just it would yeah, be quite yeah. an organic thing. Are you in? You're, you're in the 1700s? The, oh, snap. Yeah. It didn't, it, it, became, it was quite an organic thing. And we've got a, sh- we, I think we've got a shared love of a lot of things, you know, British comedy, um, physical business, you know, Pratt Falls, Scottish history though. And I think the idea of the quest of stories of the hu- the humans behind those stories, I think that's I think what yes. I know that you love, but also because because of what you and I do, we, we we're constantly we're we're sort of exposed to, to to this stuff a lot more than most people are, and so it's very easy to I find myself thinking, Christ, it's boring these days, isn't it? Mm. Like mm-hmm. our existence, uh, yeah. But it's a lot easier than what it was. So I think you're right. It's a sort of like childlike sentimentality. Mm-hmm. That that we love indulging. Mm-hmm. I love indulging it, and it doesn't hurt anyone. <laughs> and then you go to a pub. I want to go up and ask for claret. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Um, can I have your wine list, please? Do you want a quick? And yeah, I want a quick. Actor Jack Loudon was found today <laughs> with a quake pelled in his but, head. But I do, I want to sort of go, yeah, like you, you and I say all the time, we want to slam four pieces of silver down on a counter and flag in a veil. Well, keep your yeah. finest mead, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I sort of, you know, people taking sort of four days to get from London to Edinburgh. It's just why whenever I drive, I go as slow as I can. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to think, you know, the, the wandering nights... Or, or the, the, you know, the adventure of, of quest going to foreign lands and you know, the Vikings did that. And there, there is, again, a romanticism going, oh, how exciting that would have been. I mean, yeah, you were, you were killing everyone in sight. But, you know, the details, you really think to it. And the conditions that these people lived in it, it, it were, were so extreme. And ah, you'd spend if you could go back in time, you'd spend fifteen seconds and you go get I'm me out. out of here. I'm out as soon as someone yeah handed yeah. you the first meal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What is this mutton? No, yeah, but I'm a vegan. <laughs> I'm a vegan. I'm a, uh, sorry, what is that? Now talk about devil's work. Let's, so, so most of the stuff in here is from what was stolen or what was or captured. Was what was captured? It was, it was captured. Because everyone just had to drop everything and run. Mm-hmm. I mean, Cumberland was out to get yeah. everyone he could. Yeah. Um, you know, the, in the press, words like extirpate the Highlanders, the Highland race, get rid of them, so that they don't sow the seed of future generations right. of descent. But the atro- I, the, the, some of the atrocities that were committed mm. up yeah. there in, in, around Inverness, immediately yeah. after, all the way into yeah. the Highlands, all the way into are the Highlands. horrific, mm-hmm. yeah. Re- make horrific reading yeah. for what they did. That was the beginning of the end, was Culloden, was the end of the sort of Gallic culture. And it's fascinating how uh, Culloden had such an impact, and Flodden as well. These are two battles that had huge significance to Scotland, mm-hmm. and they were both 
disasters. Disasters for Scotland. Disasters for Scotland. Scotland. It was certainly well, a disaster for a whole time. load of Scots. At the time. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think there's something you might be interested in downstairs. Well, lead I on. Lead on. Go down. So here we are in the Kingdom of Scots gallery, um, and this particular gallery is devoted to mainly Renaissance, so 16th century. And the focal point right at the end of the gallery, can you see? Yes, she is. Is Her yes. Majesty Mary Queen of Scots oh. lying in great state. This is a life sized uh, replica of her tomb oh. at Westminster Abbey. And she was a tall woman, right? She was a tall woman. 5'11, I heard. Yeah, that checks out. Yeah, yeah. just done yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, just done it with his arms. Measured from arms. That's amazing. You can do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's very pale. She is very pale, very virtuous looking. Mm. So James gets down to London. He inherits Elizabeth the First throne in 1603. Elizabeth doesn't have any heirs. Even on her deathbed, she hardly names James as her successor. But he is the generally accepted one, and he is closest in line. So it makes sense. He has a shared ancestor with Elizabeth I in Henry VII, Henry Tudor. Gets down to London, and of course his mum is in Peterborough, mm -hmm. where she's been dug into a hole after her execution at Fotheringay. And he thinks, well, this isn't really where she's meant to be. And also he wants to assert and to communicate the fact that he is the son of this woman, and through this woman the Stuart line with their ancestral claims to the throne of England. So it's not just a son saying, look, let's get her down to London, I want to be near her. It's my mother had a right to rule in England and through her I have that right too. It's quite interesting that that relationship that James had with Elizabeth I would write to her, yeah. would keep her sweet. Yes. And then as soon as she passes, her sworn enemy, so to speak, he, he brings her down yeah, yeah. as a show of his power. Yeah. And James the sixth slash first, he was, that kind of sums him up, really, wasn't it? He? he was sort of a... He was he on was the a fence. He was, a, he was always changing. But I think, do you know what? He's just a politician. He's a canny man. Yeah. He's, he's a politician. And yeah. he managed to get what he wanted in the end, he which did. was succession to Elizabeth's throne and the placing of a Scottish king on without war mm -hmm. on the English throne. Which is quite it's sort of ironic. Quite, something. quite achievement. Did you know, you probably know, of course you do, that Andy played... You don't. You don't. That Andy played, Who does? Andy played her son. I, I, I played James VI Have twice. You? Yeah. In the film Made Queen of Scots. He played the son. And you he played, played Darnley. Darnley. So I played Andy's dad. Which That's is quite Which is really weird. scary. It is weird. Yes. I can see why you get cast the same, <laughs> but in the nicest possible way. <laughs> when you played James the First, mm -hmm. James the Sixth, mm -hmm. and I played your dad, Lord Henry Darnley. Yeah. Was that the first time we'd worked together? Since drama school. Professionally. Yes. Yeah, what was but, it? But we didn't get any time on set together. No. You you just turned up. Well, I was dead by that point. You were. I'd been blown Spoil up. Oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> but to, to get the chance to do that mm. is such a is a great privilege. And and we filmed the scenes that I did at Blackness Castle. I, I, and I came that day. Yes, you did. I wasn't, I wasn't filming that day, but I came because you, I couldn't get over the fact that you and me... It was the perfect culmination of... World. Our, our, of our world, where you shot Blackness Castle, where's that? Outside? Blackness Castle's close to Bowness, Bowness, and it looks on to Fife. But the, the great thing is, the link for me is that my family grew up in the, the little houses that are right beside the castle. Ah. My mum, our two sisters, my grand, my granddad, they, they lived there for years. So there was something really wonderful, you know, being able to come back and do something there. And that uh, Blackness is an amazing castle as well. And you were and playing a Stuart King. Playing a Stuart King, again. And me, I remember, stood behind the camera mm. or roughly just trying to put you off. Yeah, 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 my just eye Just not line. helping in any, get, just get me notes. 
as well. You look a yeah. bit sad. Yeah, it's a sad scene. It's, but look more sad. You're not going to do it like that, are you? Yeah, but yeah, you know, it was amazing, and I, I hope we get to do that again. I'd jump at the chance. We have a letter from one of her really staunch supporters from a man, actually, that was allied to her third husband's family, the Earl of Bothwell's Bothwell. family, mm -hmm. in 1568, as Mary is in captivity in Carlisle. But she writes to the staunch supporter, Heaven of um, Smeaton. And this would have been a treasonous letter to mm. be in possession of if you were in Scotland yeah, at that course. time that was at that moment, the, the Protestant Lords James's party were, were foremost. And you have that letter? The letter's down in Granton, but we have this voice actor who has um, this wonderful duality of her char Mary's character in the French and Scottish accents. And we've got a recording of it here oh, wow. yeah. that you can also, anyone can access on the National Museum of Scotland website. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Hit it, DJ. To a rich traced friend, the Laird of Smeaton. Rich traced friend, we write to you lately an end to our proceeding as than, thanking you I of your constance and fidelity and end us and your service, whilk ye shall not repent. With God's grace not doubting, but ye will continue therein without fear other of our enemies or tinsel of goodness. For to the end we shall put order, good willing the nearest to that effect. We are assured she will be offended, yea, and they will remove them free ford and melling with our affairs. This referring our service to your faithfulness, we commit you to the protection of God Almighty. Mighty. At Carlisle, the 25th of June, 1568, Marie Regina. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. There you are. It's so mad. And it, it, you're, you're right, is that everybody thinks, you do think of her speaking with her like a... French accent, mm. or it's the same with Bonnie Prince Charlie. I mean, Bonnie Prince Charlie, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he spoke Scots, but with a sort of Italian, Italian yeah. English -y accent. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, what is that? You know, and Scots is such an amazing language in its own, mm -hmm. but to hear mm -hmm. Scots in a French, French accent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. those sounds like, you know, France and all that. You yeah. She's got those vowels sounds, it's amazing. It's the most beautiful well, language. I mean, I'm, a luck I'm lucky that I'm a historian of that period mm. because I read this and you read the literature and the poetry as well of the mm. period. So. And it's really redolent, the sound of it. Because we did a lot of that. At, they're all Scottish in Glasgow. We do specifically mm -hmm. learn Scots. Scots we learn Scots. There, there was learned. a Scots translation that we did. Well, we did a speech from, from the two Seven of Twa Maesters. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And I remember a bit of it. He's knackered and he walks to the front of the stage, the servant, and he says, uh, My ear is here seeking, my feet are here tramping, and nifty button, fair famishing. <laughs> like, it's, it is gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. We, we could stand and speak with you for, for like, literally for hours. Oh. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, no, Anna. thank you for coming and having a look at our wonderful things. It's been amazing. Come again. Shall we mix it up, Jack? Yes, maybe we should go somewhere else because this is We're just this is ourselves. our thing. Yeah, but you know the whole point of a museum is it opens your mind. Yeah, taking different things. So I want to look at the typewriters. I know, I know. That's very specific. I want to look at the typewriters. It's so until next April. There you go. You don't until have to, then, you don't have to rush, but you also yeah, you don't have to rush, but you're obliged to you <laughs> don't, know don't, move don't. it. You if know. typewriters are your thing, don't mince a boot. Right, so here we go. The typewriter revolution. Begin after eight taps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we're, we're in a room full of typewriters through the ages. Typewriters through the ages in, in different glass cases. So I'm guessing this this is the first one we've come across. So is this the earliest one? No, I don't think it's the earliest one. Because that, that one looks a, a lot more low tech. This is called, so this, this is a prototype. Wow. 1857. 1857. People were starting to type. Wow, that's incredible. Look, it's on the top is a disc with A, B, C, D, all through the alphabet and all through one to nine in a circle on top of what looks like a sewing machine. It um, looks like a torture device as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
I don't think you're going to get any more stripped back than this with a typewriter. I mean, it's minimalist. Almost. Yes, it's, surely this is the very beginning, other than somebody putting, you know, putting it all on your knuckles and exactly covering yeah. yourself in ink and batter and paper. And that, you know, two Scottish inventors. Well, well, we did invent the world. Well, apparently it's, so, yeah. We did invent the modern world. The modern world. They are beautiful, like they really are. Yeah. Filmmakers absolutely love opening films with typewriters. There's probably like 20 or 30 films made that will have opened, their opening shot will be oh, something yeah. to do with the typewriter. Definitely. There's always, I think in fact it's, I think it's all the President's Men, the mm -hmm. very opening of all the President's Men, and it is like a super, 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 super close up of, of one of these levers going smack onto a bit of paper. I mean, that's an extreme, extreme close up. But yeah. The Shining as well. That's Shining, yes, that's right. Pull towards yeah. that. I've, I've been in a film where I've had to do an extreme close-up of my finger touch and typewriter. Mm. Have, oh. They love, there's a real fascination. Is that the Morrissey? Yeah, yeah, when he starts typing his mm. lyrics. Oh yeah, they You're love them in the film. Cheers, thanks, cheers mate. Our frame of reference to a typewriter is very close. But you think back to when the first one was being made, there would have been a lot of pushback going into the devil's work. You know? Well, it's like, like the steam, it's like the railways. Any sort of technology. You know, it was a big steaming devil. You know, it's, it's always amazing those kind of things is to think of like at the time when that came out that people were like, oh, devil ray, or this is too newfangled. No, and that's, I, that's the amazing thing about history is where you're like, just to think of people when the first typewriter came out and going, what is this devil ray? And the sort of way that we now look at, where we, we put our noses up now, where we're, we go, oh, they've come out with a 10th iPhone. Oh, it flips, the iPhone flips oh, away. Go, We don't need this. Oh, come give on. me back, give me, give me, give, yeah. give me my Nokia. There's... Which has always happened. I mean, it always happens. You it, know, it, and it's sort of like, does it not make you think when a new thing comes out, when they do an update, that we should really just shut up and enjoy the fact that people are making constant improvements to things? Hello, Hi. nice to meet you. Hi, I'm James. James. How are you um, doing? Yeah, good. So you are, are you apparently responsible for this? I am, yeah. So I'm James Inglis and I'm a PhD student at St Andrews <gasps> and I'm working on the history of typewriters in Scotland. Uh, part of that's a collaboration with the National Museum of Scotland. They've right. got a really important uh, historical collection of typewriters, about 100 machines or so. And these are some of like, the, the, kind of the best items from that collection that we've tried to use and bring out some nice social history stories mm -hmm. coming from them as well. The exhibition itself, we're trying to do from the earliest writing machines from the kind of 1700s all the way through to the latest machines from electronic machines in the 1980s and how they're used in the present day. So which, which, one, which one of these typewriters, if you had to pick one to talk about? Well, this case is all about typewriters being made in Scotland. So after the Second World War, there was two manufacturers, foreign manufacturers that set up in Glasgow. Um, one of them was Remington Rands who uh, Alex Ferguson, the football manager, actually worked for for about four years, <laughs> oh from the late 50s to the early 60s, but also Olivetti. Um, so in this case, we've got a Latera 22, which is a portable typewriter, and then we've got this Lexicon 80, which is the office typewriter. So yeah, hundreds of thousands of these, these made, and as you can see, they're, they're really popular with um, artists and writers. So you can see Leonard Cohen and Sylvia Plath. In fact, there's a, um, there's a Leonard Cohen album cover or it might be the back of the album cover where you can actually see his girlfriend using one of these typewriters. Wow. So I, mean, I, I kind of love that connection as well. But if we come to the sort of end right of the exhibition, here we've got an Oliver typewriter in this case. Um, oh wow, that looks a lot more serious. But as you can see from this image here, this is from the WSPU Typist Office. That's the Women's Social and Political Union. Better known as the suffragettes, the kind of militant oh. branch. Mm -hmm the suffrage uh, movement and um, you can actually see there's two oh, they're using one of these of, of yeah. course wow uh -huh. so it really did offer a different means of employment and financial independence yeah these were being used by uh, the suffragettes to produce kind of promotional pamphlets for, for their campaigns uh, and in this case next to the Oliver typewriter we've got this uh, it's a rotary duplicator um, so this you could photocopier basically oh yeah, my God. Photocopier. Uh, you it's wind a the handle and then that's it yeah because before then, it would have been newspapers with printed presses or, or they'd have power over what information got out there. But the typewriter for suffragettes allowed them to put their own message at a very quick pace. 
is, and yeah. that's why it became so invaluable to their movement. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, I mean the pace is what like is is really important. Like you say, this could make say 500 copies from one typewritten yeah. stencil. So yeah, it was a very powerful. I mean, they actually there was adverts for it which called it a power in politics mm. in reference right. to its its use by uh, women in the suffrage movement. Carriage return. I love the fact that you've got the constant sound of typing playing through because that is actually one of the best things about typing is the sound, the satisfying. Ding. Yeah, yeah, I love that you've got That'd that. Be good. It's kind of like horses hooves clip clopping. My heart resides in a typewriter and I don't have a heart unless there's a typewriter somewhere nearby with a chair in front of it and some blank sheets of paper. Jack Kerouac, a top in Underwood, 1941. He actually would not even buy cigarettes if he, because people used to rent typewriters back in those days. So if he didn't have the money, he would actually stop smoking. Just in order to, to uh, write. Just to be able to rent there. I that mean, it's probably a good thing, wasn't it, I suppose, now? Yeah, uh, that is. about it, but back wow. then. So that's it then. I mean, did you enjoy that? Of course I enjoyed it. I loved it. I think meeting Anna and James and hearing their passion for it mm. and they've dedicated their lives to a, a, you know, a speciality it's just so fascinating to hear them talk I, I think it's always great when you meet a historian that is very has a specific area like that because mm -hmm. I've got like a it's not a passing interest I've got an obsession mm -hmm. with Scottish history but I, I, I haven't sort of zeroed in on one particular thing in the way they can also be I think being actors we get the chance we, we kind of we're generalists because <laughs> yeah, yeah. because yeah. of the jobs we do we have to have a kind of knowledge of every, everything yeah but no real <laughs> detail <laughs> concrete just vagueness we've not dedicated our life yes. to, to one thing we are well lit vagueness is what we are well really. lit vagueness <laughs> yeah well shot well lit vagueness absolutely and I think there's also an awe of scale and th this museum in particular, I think, every corner you take, yeah. you'll have a T-Rex in one corner, then a Formula <laughs> One car. But they're, but they're amazing uh, finds, you know, and uh, I mean, we could have spent days here. It's just great to just take yourself out of life, of, of, your, of, of your sort of current existence, and just chuck yourself somewhere else. I think that's what a museum does, where, doesn't it? Where you really don't matter. No, you don't matter. The scale of things. You, but you don't matter in the past because it's already happened. So you don't matter. You can't do anything. You can't touch it. You can't affect it. You need not worry. You need not have any anxieties that you have in, in the present moment because it's already happened. I mean, that's a really good thing about the past. Maybe we should stick that on the front of this building. That's a really good thing about the past. <laughs> no, it's no, already happened. It's already happened. Thanks for listening to Meet Me at the Museum with me, Jack Loudon. And me, Andrew Rothney, at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. And if you like this episode of the podcast, then please rate, subscribe or tell a friend. And don't forget, you can show your love for museums with a National Art Pass. It gives you great benefits at hundreds of venues while raising money to support them. 